Perfect. Well, thank you, Governor. What a great kickoff to this year's uh, summit. Um, so, yep, feel free to like stretch just a little bit, grab some coffee, but our next speaker, you're going to want to be in your seat. Um, he is our first guest this morning, um, following the governor's keynote, and he comes to us with 38 years in the military. From his advisory role to the president, secretary of defense, the National Security Council, and the Department of Defense, and his expansive credentials, General Craig McKinley continues to be a strong leader even after retirement. The four-star general was a member of the Social, Emotional, and Academic Development Commission that provided a report titled, From a Nation at Risk to a Nation at Hope. We are grateful that he flew all the way from Florida to share his story and teach us more about what we all need to know to be a champion for kids. Helping us understand the what, getting to the basics and the skills for life and learning, is four-star general Craig McKinley. Please give him a warm North Dakota welcome. visiting North Dakota for the first time. I, uh, I had a chance to go to high school in Faribault, Minnesota. Uh, my dad was a mining engineer and traveled all over the world. And he thought at age 14, I ought to go to a place that taught me a little discipline, taught me how to wear a military uniform and how to be prepared for life. And I will always value that education I had at Shattuck. Today at Shattuck St. Mary's, some of you who have kids who played hockey know that it's a center of excellence for hockey development now. It certainly wasn't that when I was there because it was a military school. And my curriculum included being part of the junior ROTC there. So when I was 17 and a junior at Shattuck, uh, my mentor, uh, Dean Harold O'Connor, who was a World War II bomber pilot, looked at me and said, you know something, McKinley, you really ought to try to get an ROTC scholarship to school. I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Many of your students may not know what it is either, but it's an opportunity to go to the college of your choice, all expenses paid, and for four years, you get a salary commensurate with going to school, which gave me a little spending money. So how did I do that? You have to obviously apply. And the only Air Force base near Faribault, Minnesota, because Minnesota has no active duty military bases, is Grand Forks. So I got a ride up to Minneapolis Airport, got a flight on North Central Airlines, as I recall, had a big duck on the tail, to Grand Forks. And I took the Air Force officer qualifying test. I had no idea what I was in for. It was a SAT score on steroids. It talked about emotional skills. It tested your ability to relate well to other people. It gave some math science on how, if you were a flyer, uh, you would get from point A to B. And fortunately enough, my education gave me the background so that I didn't score the highest on that test, but I passed. And I was offered the opportunity to go to flight school after college and one of my lifelong dreams was to fly airplanes. And 
Optimists like Wilbur and Orville Wright invented the airplane. Pessimists invented the parachute. <laughs> I had a chance to go through flight school, worked with one of your great North Dakota general officers, General Chuck Wald, who went to North Dakota State University, was an All-America football player there. Chuck and I went through 38, 40 years of Air Force time. Uh, Chuck is now working in Washington, D.C. He asked that I give you his regards. But I will tell you, it was a game changer for my life. I, uh, I was asked when I got back to my high school, because it was Army ROTC, uh, why I didn't want to go to West Point or go to the Army. And I, and I answered that I found out that good food and clean sheets were readily available on nearby Air Force bases. And that's the truth. It's a quality of life and it's a culture. So let me, uh, let me start by just, uh, we're at kind of a critical phase uh, in our nation where we've had some serious tragedies in our school system. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and uh, it kind of started with Columbine, uh, went to Sandy Hook, Parkland in Florida, where I live now, and recently at Uvalde. And it's such a tragedy to see what happens at these schools. And I want to give the, the teachers and the administrators in this audience my highest personal regards for going to school every day, for teaching your students, but taking on a role and responsibility that has only occurred uh, really recently uh, in our history, where you're also providing security and comfort and safety for your students, for the schools, for the administration, and I commend each and every one of you who are in this profession. It's, uh, it's remarkable. Give yourself, uh, give yourself that round of applause. Uh, before I go into my very brief slide presentation on why uh, the Aspen Institute, I think, did an amazing job uh, with this report, I want to talk a little bit about teachers. Uh, in Washington, Yesterday and even today, uh, articles are in the press about how teaching has become one of the most draining jobs in America. Today's teachers are navigating, as I just mentioned, school shootings, a pandemic turning into an endemic, and intensifying political interference in building your lesson plans. And all while, relatively speaking, your wages have remained stagnant. Uh, why does that matter? Teachers are asking whether the burdens are worth it. Experts warn of a coming staffing shortage. Teaching has long been an underpaid profession, but in the last two years, America's demands on its educators have mounted. I gotta tell you, I don't, I don't know uh, how our students have survived uh, this year and a half going on two years uh, of living in a pandemic to go like a light switch from in-school teaching, going uh, with your classmates to school, uh, and within weeks, months, being locked down in your homes, and teachers and administrators having to provide instantaneously the ability to take virtual class. To me, uh, that's a remarkable credit to each and every one of you, and it's a credit to the students who were able to work through that time and get back to in-residence learning. I think if we learn nothing else with this pandemic, uh, as Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly does rhyme. And what we learned in the 20th century with the flu epidemic, which I never learned about from my parents or grandparents, don't know if you did, the number of people who uh, were affected by that pandemic in the early part of the 20th century, uh, we should be prepared for just about anything. And so for those of you in the teaching profession, I commend you again for what you're doing. I was asked uh, after I retired from 38 years in the Air Force and then five years in the nonprofit world to join the Aspen commissioners who looked at this issue. I wanna give you just a little background then we'll zing through the slides and get you to, to what I know you want is a break. 
The Aspen Institute National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development was created to engage and energize communities in re-envisioning learning to encompass its social, emotional, and cognitive dimensions to all the children so that they can succeed. Nobody said it better than your governor. Things have changed. The 20th century has been gone now for 21 and a half years, almost 22 years. You in this room know more than anybody what those demands have created. So the Aspen Institute, a nonprofit in Washington, which looks at a number of issues in their history, was commissioned to do this. We had 23 great commissioners from a wide variety of backgrounds, mostly educators, so you can understand that they were foremost. We had politicians who understand what legislation can do to help you all in your profession. And I was the one military uh, outlier. And why did they want me to participate? As the governor said, commander in chief of his National Guard, the military has a high demand for new younger people who don't necessarily want to come serve for a career, but who want to learn a profession. And so uh, I came in to say, if we don't have our students prepared for that next phase of life, they, they probably won't make it into the military. The governor was right. Less than one half of 1% of our nation's youth can qualify to become members of the military. And he gave you the reasons why. It could be an academic issue. It could be a brush with the law. It could be physical aptitude. A lot of our students today don't have the time to get physically fit. Luckily, we can bring most of those students on board who have an interest and qualify them for service. But I was the one who said that social, emotional, academic development is a national security issue. So with that, let's see if I could make the first slide hit. That's me. Next. Am I moving it forward? There we go. And that's the book. This book, I hope many of you will want to have. And at the end of this briefing, it will show you how to get this book. But it's two and a half work, years of hard work uh, with that wide variety of commission involvement and that wide variety of student, parent, and administration involvement. And so I think you'll enjoy uh, getting a copy of that and it will be available for you. This is our main quote that we started our endeavor with. I think the pivot point is now. I think that we're in this moment for a brief period and we'll either get through it and we'll be able to take this nation to higher regards in terms of a world environment. That's who we are. That was the coalition that we put together, that the Aspen Institute did. Our mission and outcomes, we always need that to get fundamentally started. I should have a video that will queue up. I don't know if it's ready. There was a belief that you could just go. Go ahead with the video. That was a pretty good jump, wasn't it? There was a belief that you could just go direct to the academics. That we now know that's not true. We're learning a lot about the science of learning, and we're understanding that learning is social and emotional, and learning is also interactive. We can make learning happen because we know so much more about how it happens. The science is overwhelming. Social and emotional learning is a booster rocket to all the things we already measure in our educational system achievement, graduation rate, post-secondary enrollment, attainment, attachment to the workplace, civic engagement. We do big longitudinal studies which have shown children's functioning is tied to a set of key life outcomes 20 to 30 years later. They're not just academic outcomes, they're life outcomes. As I started to spend more time with other business leaders, what I learned is that it wasn't just Accenture and it wasn't just consulting or technology companies. We have hundreds of thousands of very high-paying job opportunities, but nobody to fill them. 
If we can figure out a way to get the right skills and capabilities of students so that we don't have to create those skills in them, then our businesses will be more successful. So it's that simple. From my experience in the United States military, it's something that we as leaders should encourage all of our communities to look at to see if it would be applicable for their young people. It has to be done. The price for not doing it is too high. I want school to be the place that's the most exciting place in America to be for kids and for adults alike. I want school to be the place of dreams, of excitement, of inspiration, of pursuit, of curiosity, of challenge, of community, of team building. We've got the moment. We now have to capitalize upon it. I think that video kind of points out that most people understand that learning isn't just about the four walls of the academic environment. And it's not just about teachers. It's, just, it's all about everyone around them, from the school bus driver, uh, but it's inclusive of your families, obviously the schools and your educators, and out of school time providers in the community. Boys clubs, girls clubs, 4-H, governor did a great job of that. We basically agree on the skills necessary for learning to happen, but we often use different language. As the governor said, in North Dakota, there are great academic institutions, but there are many more that can take advantage of some of these core competencies. Some are academic, some are interpersonally, that are necessary for readiness ac across college, career, military, and life, and particularly civic life. I think what I learned as a commissioner is it takes the entire village. It takes the entire state of North Dakota. It takes Dickinson. It takes Bismarck. It takes Fargo, every small community around. The demand for focus on a broad set of skills often called social and emotional skills, is astronomical from school leaders, classroom teachers, and employers. As I said, I started out in high school in a junior ROTC program. Not sure whether Dickinson has that or not, but many of your high schools do. Some children are not availed of that opportunity, which gives them a taste of what service before self is all about, uh, but it's important that if you don't have that, that you in the academic world can give those young people the opportunity to see what life in those careers has presented. One thing as chief of the National Guard Bureau that I learned is not all students uh, who are availed these types of academic and social and emotional trainings uh, do fall off by the wayside. We have a program called the National Guard Youth Challenge. Uh, these skills that we teach young people here at Dickinson Middle School sometimes have to be relearned or learned for the first time by young men and women who didn't have that chance, who got in trouble with the law, who might have fallen off uh, the basic skill set that some of your students have. So I was proud to watch North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota collaborate uh, in the Youth Challenge Program and help those who did fall by the wayside because we can't leave any student behind. One of the first points of consensus on the commission was that we're not exclusively talking about schools. Rather, we need to acknowledge the pre-K through 12 education ecosystem that includes all the people, all the places, all the systems engaged in education. And ideally, this ecosystem puts students and their families in the center surrounds them with people and institutions who contribute to their growth 
and development including schools, after school, libraries, employers, and other community institutions are part of this. But this ecosystem also acknowledges the role that policymakers, influencers, and implementers have on the people and institutions educating our children. I think what I'm gonna show you and not read the slides because these are gonna be available to you and you don't need to take notes if you don't want, shows you some of the things about what the science of learning has offered us. Uh, these are not obviously my words. These are words from uh, career educators. And I think uh, most of you have learned these and you've applied them in your own backgrounds. But the center circle uh, represents the student as part of a family who are their first teachers and the foundation from which all learning experiences obviously take place. The locations across the top acknowledge the people and the places who create learning experiences at home, school, and the community, in interactions with adults and peers. Finally, the stack bars acknowledge all the types of learning experiences, such as the cafeteria or the library, as well as all of the out-of-school opportunities, extracurricular and enrichment activities, volunteer operations, and public space like parks, zoos, and other areas. The reality is that we could get caught up in names and terminology, but when we focus on consensus, we realize that we're all advocating for an approach to learning and development grounded in the evidence that learning happens across the entire cognitive domain. These were all words that came out in our commission visits to Cleveland, to Tacoma, to Seattle, and uh, to Austin, Texas. Uh, as you all do, we whiteboarded these, and every one of these words, terminologies, has an impact. So our approach, we believed, uh, to education needs to be grounded in a deeper understanding of the child and human development or the science of learning and development. Just to underscore this point on terminology, during our period of listening and learning, Commissioner Jorge Benitez, former CEO of Accenture, and I hosted a virtual business leaders focus group that provided some great insight on how the business community talks about social and emotional skills. On the slide, you'll see the terms that they generated to describe competencies needed to be sex successful in the workplace. It's also important to note that this list was more expansive than the list of skills that we heard from other stakeholders, stakeholders including educators. These are the additional takeaways from the meeting. Those of you who are business leaders in your world now, uh, you're, you, you have a different set of requirements for young people. These skills are sought both for hiring and promotion. Business has a desire to help find common language with educators, but want to think more globally about social and emotional skills. This includes being aware of cult cultural competencies within the US and abroad. Uh, from a national security perspective, I would suggest that there are other peer competitors in the world who have put a high emphasis on social, emotional, and academic development and are in competition with us today with their young people. Business obviously wants to be partners with schools, particularly in this work. And again, I would like to thank the sponsors of today's activity who have made this opportunity available to all of us. As we focused on consensus, we turned to the academics supporting our work to understand the foundational science of how learning really happens. Then it impacts how we design, organize schools, how we train teachers, and how we build communities supporting schools. I'm gonna do my best to explain the science, but I want to start with quotes from two members of our Council of Distinguished Scientists who helped us clearly understand how the process of learning is both social and emotional. Let's see if I can get to those quotes. This, let's see, do we have that? There we go. Uh, Patricia Kuhl of the University of Washington said the power of the social brain has been totally underestimated. It's the driving force in cognition. It's the gateway to learning. And Mary Helen Imerdino Yang from USC said the process of building knowledge is an inherently emotionally connected, deeply subjective experience. Now we've got the staircase to 
what we call academic heaven, starting at the bottom with some of our younger people, uh, growing into the middle school, and then going into higher education. And I'm going to zip through these because I want to I want to get to the point uh, where we can uh, take a little rest break. But the, this figure puts these skills in the context of how learning happens, recognizing both the interconnection of these skills in the context of the learning environment and all of those who are engaging in learning. Again, the community, students, teachers, families, and the broader community. Importantly, this set of skills and competencies develop and are used in dynamic interaction with attitudes and values, shown in the second ring in the figure to the right. Attitudes, beliefs, and mindsets include children, use attitudes and beliefs about themselves, others, and their own circumstances, obviously affected very significantly with the pandemic. The self-context, the efficacy and motivation and purpose for our students, these types of attitudes and beliefs are a powerful influence on how children and youth interpret and respond to events and interactions throughout their day. Character and values represent ways of thinking and habits that support children and youth to work together as friends, family, and community, and encompass understanding, caring about, and acting on core ethical values. In the Air Force, for example, we have three core values. It is integrity, service above self, and excellence in all we do. Those are the three things that we try to teach our young people. And each service, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard do the same. Finally, another scientific look uh, as we look at how to translate the science into schools and classrooms. The consensus from a practitioner point of view has three components. Learning settings are a developmental influence. It's developed by the family community and societal context in which the students grow. Learning settings that support young people's comprehensive growth open, often focuses on three essential elements. Teaching, social and emotional skills, embedding these skills in all learning, and creating environments where students feel safe. I come back to the safety aspect and congratulate and commend each and every one of you for providing that safe environment for your students. And finally, the student outcomes. The evidence shows that students who experience uh, these factors do far better and are more likely to achieve success both now and in the future across the four critical domains, your academics, your workforce and career, civic engagement, and health and well-being. As I mentioned previously in January 2019, we published this book. I'll show it again. I'd really commend each and every one of you try to get this. They are available. Uh, the final report shared a roadmap for how to move forward and break down the traditional boundaries of where, when, and how learning happens, grounded in the evidence of our evolving understanding of the social, emotional, and cognizant domains. This is the final segment uh, of our work. Uh, it seems like a long time ago that we actually did this work, but I think it's more relevant today than it could have been even in 2019. Again, I'll come back to the many challenges uh, that our students, teachers, academicians, and all the people who are associated with what you do. And finally, uh, it was a long meeting at the end to say that we are a nation at hope. We're at hope because of the great job you and your teams do across our nation. We wanted to baseline it so that every community, every state, every uh, commonwealth in this country has this basic understanding that I saw your governor convey very meaningful today, me meaningfully today in his words. And having the sixth education summit uh, that you are in, many of you, how many have been to all six? Uh, it's wonderful that you have this uh, in North Dakota. I participated in uh, this seminar in Idaho, as I said earlier, and Governor Butch Otter, who's, who's been replaced, uh, was great, and he, in, he lifted up the community that you all serve in. Um, I want to I kind of close with something I saw the other day. 
uh, and it kind of talks about where we are mentally today. In the news cycle, I'm aware of the somber news that we all carry. The environment, the war in Ukraine, systemic abuses of senseless and preventable deaths of the pandemic now turned to an endemic. In all the governments of your life, and I think that's a great phrase, the government of your kitchen table, your friendship group, your workplace or place of worship, your city, county, state, or country, may we all amplify and demand language that will serve life and not fail it. It's been a privilege to be with you. Um, Maria Nesset and my team in Washington at the Aspen Institute, uh, led by Jennifer Lerner, uh, gave me this opportunity. I jumped at it. I commend each and every one of you for what you do. We will be having a group panel later in the day. Uh, so if you'll save your questions for me and make them as easy as possible and talk about that brilliant fall that I executed off the side, I will be glad to answer them then. Thank you, God bless you. Thank you all for what you do.